my reaction in seeing that was, holy crap, that took a lot of guts. <laughs> I felt sort of like a thriller, like every moment, like, you know, what's going to happen to Jose? Um, so Jose, you know, you've just shown a theater full of people an incredibly personal story. <laughs> and, and I, you know, we covered this a little bit in the film, but what, can you tell us about that moment? Like, what compelled you to make this film? And how do you think this kind of personal sharing of stories has helped the dialogue around immigration reform? Um, <laughs> first of all, thank you so much for being here and for staying. Um, and by the way, I have to really credit, um, before I answer that question. Oh, thank you. So I should just say one thing. So filmmaking is really probably the most collaborative art there is. And you couldn't do something like this without a team of people. I'm so sorry to embarrass them. <laughs> Ann Lupo, Sabrina, Gordon, Jake Honig, Anthony. Can you all stand up, my team of filmmakers who are here? Um, and I don't know if you noticed, but our uh, executive producers, just, I'm so sorry for embarrassing you. Sean Parker was one of our executive producers, so I'm not sure if he's here. Uh, Matthew Hilsick and Liz Simons, please stand up. Um, so why do this? I was really afraid of this film. I was afraid of it because I, I didn't want it to be this vanity act. I didn't want it to be this narcissistic, you know what I'm saying? Like, originally my plan was to do a film on dreamers. And so I met Gabby and we interviewed a guy named Roy Naim, who's an undocumented Jew, born in Israel, moved to Brooklyn when he was three. We found all these other people. And then halfway through the filming, one of my friends said, um, how can you do this film and not have your mom? And I was afraid of that because, as you can see, I didn't know how to feel about my mom. I didn't know. I have numbed myself so much to feel the way I'm supposed to feel. And I just want you to imagine, as we, you know, in terms of personal stories, as sometimes we get so caught up with immigration about being Republican or Democrat or about border security or all those things, I want you to just think that you just saw one story. Can you imagine how many other broken families are out there experiencing the exact same thing? And so it's funny because people have said that, you know, I've come out, I guess, twice in my life. <laughs> I'm totally done. Um, <laughs> and as far as I'm concerned, and Gabby can speak to this as well, is, you know, people like me are not coming out. We're just letting you in uh, of what the reality is to be in this situation and what choices you have to make. And to me, that's what personal stories add. It makes it less about politics and policy and make it about you know, kind of the stories that are at stake. And that's why we decided to do this film. And I'm just glad that, you know, I wasn't sure it was gonna resonate with people, especially putting my Lola there in rollers. I was like, oh my God, <laughs> Lola, my Lola is here. <laughs> so, so, uh, <laughs> so yeah, to me, that's what personal storytelling does. Oh, here's my Lola. Oh. <laughs> so, um, so Ruchi, you know, I, I know that you know, um, you're an immigrant as well, and I know you've had a somewhat different experience than Jose, but I'm curious kind of what, what similar themes you see, and if you can tell us a little about your story as an immigrant. I'd like to start off by thanking Jose for sharing his story. It was so emotional, I couldn't stop crying every five minutes. So thank you, Jose, thank you, Lola, thank you, everybody on his team for the most amazing documentary I've seen. Um, it was extremely touching. So I came to the United States in 2000 as a student, and since then, I've been on many different visas, everything from an H-1B, a CBT, an OPT, an F-1, and now finally a green card. <laughs> um, <laughs> So my story is not as emotional as Jose's. Um, but unlike Jose, I had choices. And I made the decision to stay in the United States because I believed I would only have opportunities here that I was looking for. 
And I also stayed because of the tech industry. Um, but like Jose, my journey was fraught with a lot of uncertainty, and it was stressful. As a new college student, um, I was looking for a job. That process in its, of itself is stressful. But as an international student, um, the number of jobs and companies I could apply to were limited. And the uncertainty of whether or not I could get a visa was nerve-wracking. You hear all these crazy stories, like the H-1B cap being hit in 10 days, being hit in a few weeks, and then in a few months. And every year, it only gets worse. And then when you get a job, it's really difficult to switch jobs. It's really difficult to even change your job title. It's difficult to actually get a raise and change your salary, especially if you're on the way or in the process of getting a green card. And the uncertainty is not just with your professional life, but your personal life as well. So it makes planning your life hard. And all of these things that I've talked about, um, finding a job, choosing where you work, choosing where you live, should all be fundamental choices. But as an immigrant, these are just really hard, stressful decisions. And you're just basically surrounded by uncertainty all the time. So Andrew, um, you founded Groupon, one of the fastest growing tech companies of our era. Can you describe how immigration played a role in, in your experience? Sure. I'm, you know, I, I think what, what I saw at Groupon um, was a, a subset of a larger truth, which is that immigrants are good for America. Um, if you think about it, people who are ambitious and industrious enough to you know, venture out of their home country into unfamiliar territory, maybe without family, maybe, um, uh, maybe they don't even speak the, the language very well, um, those are the kind of people that you want. And America is existence proof of that as a country that was founded by immigrants. Um, and, uh, and so I think that's true on a, on a large scale, and we saw it for sure in the tech industry. You know, we, we grew very fast, uh, hiring about 10,000 people uh, over from inception to about four years old. And, um, but, but most of those people were customer service and sales. We actually were very slow in hiring um, high-skilled uh, engineers. And it's not because we didn't want to hire more. Uh, we, wanted, we, we never hit the number that, that we wanted to hire in any, 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 any given year. Um, and it's not because they didn't exist. In fact, we were having conversations with them uh, constantly in their, in their home countries, but we constantly ran into problems where we just simply couldn't get visas to bring these people um, who were highly capable um, and we were prepared to pay whatever it took to get them over here. Uh, we, just, we just couldn't get them. And, and, uh, and it, it never made much sense. Um, it, 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 uh, it was impeding us as a company from creating more jobs and growing the company faster, from doing more things for our customers. It was just standing in the way of us doing things that would make this, um, that, that would help America grow. Um, and so Rich and Andrew, we sometimes hear the argument that the tech industry just wants more visas so they can hire foreign workers to pay lower wages than Americans. Um, how do you guys see that argument? Well, uh, I mean, I, I think what I say, uh, again, about, uh, about the, the high-skilled workers applies. Anyone who's ambitious enough to, um, to, to, to leave their country, that's the, that's the kind of person um, that uh, that's, uh, has an above-average chance of doing great things. And that's why America is such a great country. You know, I think beyond that, it's, it's, just, a, it's just an ethical issue. I mean, uh, it, it comes down to the golden rule for, for me. Um, <laughs> You know, I've, I've spent enough time in other countries to believe that there's something very special about the United States. And um, I, I imagine being in someone else's shoes. And, and if, if I wanted to come start a company here or, or, or build, build a life here, and somebody told me that I couldn't, you know, that, that would be frustrating, especially when you consider the fact that I can is an accident that I had nothing to do with. And it's one thing to um, it, it, it's one thing to reap the benefits of that accident, but then to try to deny it from other people just feel, feels kind of nasty. You know, it's like yeah. walking down a street. Yeah. I'll stop there. Um, so to build the best products and to build the best companies, we need the best people. And I know that many of my colleagues in the audience can attest to the fact that we do not pay lower wages to get the best people. <laughs> um, I, the way I see it, essentially, is that we just don't have enough supply to fulfill the demand um, for highly skilled, qualified people. 
And I believe um, the Congressional Budget Office recently announced um, estimates based on the Senate bill today that talks about the fact that over 120,000 jobs will be created a year because of the newly proposed Senate bill. So um, I don't think we're going to be lowering wages and also earnings for all American workers will probably increase by $470 billion in the, in the next decade or so. So um, I honestly think it's a myth and not really true. So Gabby and Jose, what is the involvement of the tech community meant to you as folks that are personally living through this every day? So I think it's really important to just pause and say thank you. Um, thank you to the people that got us where we're at today. If it wasn't for a teacher that believed in us, a neighbor, um, if it wasn't for a preacher and the community that we come from, we wouldn't be here. And I'm hoping that this event, it's kind of like a, those dominoes that fall. Um, it took doing a walk to get some attention and people believed in us and believed in that walk. And then people believed in Jose and believed in what he is doing. And I think the, there wouldn't be a movement if there wasn't Facebook. Uh, there wouldn't be a movement if there wasn't Twitter and uh, just the social media that we use to get the word out. And one of the things that we would always say was that the revolution wasn't gonna be televised. <laughs> and that nobody was gonna tell the story that we were telling like ourselves. And it was our story to tell, and we were gonna put it out there because we were done hiding, we were done being in fear, and it was important uh, to be able to have those tools. And so I wanna say thank you to you, to you and to you, and to everybody that made this possible. Um, and of course to Facebook, uh, which has stopped many deportations. Yes. Facebook that uh, uh, has allowed for us to be able to communicate and be in touch with our family members back at home. And uh, it, Facebook, it's, it's our little community where we feel safe and we're able to um, just expose ourselves and, and be like anybody else. Um. God, isn't it amazing? So I was, I was sitting, I was working for Ariana Huffington, sitting in my cubicle in New York, when somebody forwarded me a YouTube video of this woman walking from Miami to Washington, D.C. And then we had Felipe, Juan, Juan and Carlos. There was four people that were walking, and she was one of the people in the videos. And now I'm sitting here next to her. <laughs> Three years later, um, Back to your point about dominoes falling. I mean, I would hope that, look, this is where I'm from, and I'm proud to be from the Bay Area. Um, I would just hope that this is the kind of event that can be modeled, that we can have in communities across the country as we debate this immigration bill. And it and, doesn't stay here. And it doesn't stay here. And that we figure out how we can get people together from different groups, right? And that we realize that, again, we have a stake at each other. I mean, this is what's so special about this event. I mean, from the very beginning, when Joe and I would talk about Forward That Us, you know, it was always about, it is always about the big picture. And I don't think after this event, I don't think you can argue that. I think <laughs> the fact that you have a room with, you know, day workers and dreamers and families, and, you know, we have a contingent of many undocumented parents in this audience, and you have some of the most powerful tech leaders in the country all speaking the same words, that we want immigration reform and we want it now. So this is a moment, and I'm just happy to be a part of it. Um, so one of my favorite parts of uh, earlier today was getting to meet um, so many of the dreamer moms who I see sitting right there. Um, so Gabby, can you tell us a bit about, about the work of the Dreamer Moms and kind of how they've gotten involved and the role they've been playing? So I don't know any other individual that is more powerful um, than a mother. And the mothers who are here today are mothers who have sacrificed everything uh, for their children. And they left their language, their own family, their culture, everything behind to give us an opportunity. And so these moms that are here are incredible. They come from everywhere. They're 
are in like eight different states and they're growing. And they came out of the DACA clinics. And so we were having these clinics and the moms were just there and they started talking to one another and started helping each other and they realized that they had commonalities and that all they wanted was a better life and a better future for their children. So they got together and they started organizing and this just happened a little less than a year ago. And they've been just a force to be reckoned with. And uh, you know, some of the moms are not here because they unfortunately were deported. And um, today with us we have in the audience a very young man, brave young man. Uh, he's 18 years old. And his mom was deported when he was in high school. He has a twin brother. And one of the things that he tells about his own life and his own struggle is that he now has a green card. But he got the green card because he was put in foster care. And so the state of Florida practically became his parents. And being the state of Florida, the state of Florida, he was able to get a, uh, what they call the, uh, what is it? Juvenile visa. Super Yes, <laughs> a special juvenile visa. And he says that he wishes he didn't have that at the stake of being separated from his own mother, um, who uh, was deported. And he graduated by himself. He went and crossed that stage and got the diploma and got the letter of acceptance to the university he applied to and has the, all the grades and everything to show for it, but not a mother that he could hug and say thank you for everything that she's done and have a mother to feel proud of him. And I just want us to um, give him love because he is doing such a great job and organizing and not allowing for that to stop him. And so I just wanted to say thank you to Jose. Um, so one of the, Jose, one of the parts of the film I thought was kind of most powerful was when you were in Alabama and Iowa. Um, Talk to yeah, Grassley. Very, very Talk to Grassley. We have not spoken. Uh, <laughs> not yet, but we will. Um, it was clear that, you know, to me that explaining your personal story, you had people who have been seemingly opposed. I mean, a guy who even interrupted you yeah. in his opposition, you know, starting to become more open. So how do you see that kind of process spreading and scaling? I know this is going to sound crazy, but I'm just going to say it. Um, <laughs> there isn't anybody in this country that I will not talk to. <laughs> there isn't anybody in this country that G Gabby would not talk to. That is true. If you put us <laughs> in front of any group, Republican, Democrat, anybody, and we just explain to them what the situation is, look, I believe that Americans fundamentally are good, kind people. I know this because I've been a beneficiary of the kindness and the generosity of a high school principal who bought me my first ever laptop because she was like afraid that I was just typing my homework. You know, I, she's here, Pat Highland. Um, and, and Gabby and I talk a lot about this. There are Pat Highlands all across the country that do this for people like us. And so that's why it's really important for me. I've been about 130 events in 31 states. This, you know, Gabby with the bridge project and with Define American, I'm really hoping that we take the film in like other places that may not be as friendly um, and invite people and really start a conversation. This is a tough crowd here. It's a, this is, this is a, <laughs> but you know, I recently played the Iowa scene in front of a mostly Republican crowd in, in Indianapolis. It was great. <laughs> You play that and then all of a sudden, questions started coming up. I mean, immigration is the most controversial <laughs> yet least understood issue in America. People simply do not know how the process works. But once you explain to people, you, 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 you saw the woman talk to Grassley. You know, she wanted to help, <laughs> right? But we have to be able to actually talk to each other. We as Americans have to be able to sit and have these uncomfortable conversations, even with people who we think may be against us, but may not be against us. Yeah. And we're not gonna get anywhere with this issue if we just stay in our corners and point at each other. Um, look, as we all know, you know, people's lives are at stake. You know? um, and, and this is one thing that I think we have to remind ourselves. This is the 50th year of the march in Washington. 
when Martin Luther King gave his speech, I have a dream speech, 50, 50 years this August. And one of the quotes from Martin Luther King that I think is so important to remember and it's really relevant here is when Martin Luther King said that history will record that in this period of social transition, which is where we are, the greatest tragedy is not the strident clamor of the bad people, but the appalling silence of the good people. <laughs> we cannot afford for you to be silent anymore. That's why for us, having Joe get on this fight, having Mark Zuckerberg talk about the kids that he wants to tutor that, he, that are his kids, these are about people speaking up and making sure that their voices are heard and that we, you have to be allies. And that's why I think, that's where I see us kind of going from here on out. And mm -hmm. you know, again, like, this is why having these kind of gatherings is important. Um, Ruchi and Andrew, have you guys experienced friends or colleagues who've had to leave the country for immigration reasons? I recently came across a college, a Stanford grad, um, who got a job offer in McKinsey, New York, and um, could not get an H-1B um, because he didn't get, I mean, he didn't get one of those lottery H-1Bs and had to go back. Um, I also have met a lot of friends and have had a lot of friends since my college days who decided they didn't want to put up with the hassle of getting a visa. Um, and didn't want to deal with the uncertainty of getting a visa and went back. And these are the people who are actually running and managing co companies and businesses and building things elsewhere. Um, it's interesting because about 40% of our math and science graduates um, are educated in the top tier US colleges and universities and then go back home. And I think that in today's environment, especially in today's competitive ec economic environment, America just needs to find ways to attract and keep these people here. Um, so yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I remember um, as uh, I, I, you know, I built my company in, in Chicago, but I, I spent more time in Silicon Valley. The, these, and our company got larger. Before, like these stories seemed like things that would happen in in like fiction or in, in movies because they just seemed, it seemed so surreally bizarre and counterproductive and everybody that I met seemed to have a story like this of somebody that they, they knew um, who had been deported or couldn't go home or couldn't come, uh, couldn't get to the United States and I, I still remember how remarkably strange it, it was, how prevalent these problems are. And I, I apologize, this is too personal, but have you guys had experiences of you know, some of the friends that you guys have made who have not been able to stay? <laughs> Gabby, go ahead. Go first. <laughs> so I've gotten calls at 3 in the morning, 4 in the morning, um, people crying and just having to wait like 10, 15 minutes for the person to finish crying to finally hear that <clears throat> a loved one has been put in detention or um, deported. And a friend that I made through um, trying to stop his deportation, uh, we, weren't able, we were able to stop his and his brother's deportation because right now there's like a hierarchy of goodness, I guess. I don't know how to you know, <laughs> really describe it, but dreamers are seen as the nice ones and the ones that we want to keep, right? And because they came on no fault of their own and it's their parents' fault and, um, <clears throat> you know, this really horrible kind of victim and, you know, they're the parents are the culpable ones for, for everything that is happening. Um, and so a friend of mine and his brother <clears throat> were able to stay because the senator um, submitted a private bill, but the parents weren't. And they, the parents were deported back to Colombia and it's been years since my friends haven't been able to see their parents. And this is something that happens every okay. single day. As we're we have that. over a thousand people that get deported every single day. On, every, on any given night, there's 34,000 people that sleep in detention centers, that sleep in jails. And one of the hardest things that I think our community has to, 
had had to deal with is the fact that you have a president who said, and I remember this as if it was yesterday, when he was debating Hillary, <clears throat> and said, there's one thing that I'm going to do. And then the first thing I'm going to do is pass the DREAM Act. And in the first 100 days, I'm going to pass immigration reform. And yet, he is a president that has supported the most people than any president. In modern history. Yeah. 1.7 million people have been deported during the Obama administration. And <clears throat> this is something that um, it's totally, it, it, there's no reasoning. There's no explanation for it. Um, and so we, we see it on an everyday basis. It's something that it's very common. And you know, during the walk, we met so many children that were left behind, um, sleeping in couches and floors of family members um, that couldn't really take care of their own children but had to take care of these other children that um, when they came back from school, their parents had been already deported. The, the point that I really <coughs> want to add is, so I'm a part of what's called a mixed status family. There are 17 million households in America where there's at least one undocumented person in the family. So I come from like a large Filipino family, <laughs> many of whom are here. <laughs> um, so out of like 35 of them, I'm the only one of 35 people in my immediate family who was undocumented, right? And that tells you that this is an issue that is completely integrated in American life. Meaning when you call somebody illegal or when you deport somebody, you're actually talking about someone's mom, someone's uncle, someone's sister, someone's <clears throat> aunt. And that to me is like one of the biggest misperceptions about this issue, right? Like you're not deporting one person, you're deporting a community. You're deporting a network of people. Um, and I know this is one little anecdote. There's a woman here named Guadalupe Ariola. I mean, uh, Andiola, Guadalupe Andiola, <laughs> she's right there. <laughs> Andiola. <laughs> Lo siento, senora. Uh, <laughs> but ICE picked her up at her house in Mesa, Arizona. Her daughter, Erica Andiola, got on Facebook at like 3.30 in the morning and told people, hey, my mom just got picked up by ICE. By 4 o'clock, there's 40 of us on a conference call, trying to Facebook with each other, figuring out how are we going to get, how are we going to help Erica, and how are we going to get her mother back? Within 24 hours, there was enough movement that the bus was literally driving to Mexico, and ha she was going to get deported. The bus went back and got her up. So this is happening literally in every corner of the internet, right? Um, but this has to stop, you know? And look, you know, at the end of the day, I cover the, the Obama administration. I mean, I cover the Obama campaign. All I know is the moment the president got elected, what luck do, does, do Gabriela and I, the Gabby and I have to be given citizenship when the very citizenship of this democratically elected president was being questioned? The birther movement, right? <laughs> so I, I mean, I think we have to really look at this. Look, at the end of the day, I don't think, fr frankly, I don't think the president is going to, able, going to be able to escape this history. But we also know that the president wants something to happen. And we know that you know, fair-minded Republicans want something to happen. And we know that it's time that something happens. And we're hoping that it will. And they all have the power to do it. And they all have the power to do it, yes. So speaking of members of Congress, Ruchi, you recently testified before the Senate. Can you tell us a little bit about what that experience was like? Um, so Joe calls me because he never emails me, but he calls me, which is very <laughs> rare in today's day and age. He's like, do you want to testify in front of the Senate? And I was like, Joe, what does that mean? And I'm not American. I don't understand it. He's like, you'll be a witness, and you can testify in front of the Senate. And it'll be great. And I was like, that doesn't sound like fun. I'll be a witness. I have to prepare a five-minute speech. I had the same moment where I was timing myself and was afraid I'd go over time, <laughs> um, that I'd be asked all these questions. Um, and I was like, being a witness at a Senate testimony does not sound like fun. Why should I do this? He was like, you will remember this for the rest of your life. Um, and I did. So thank you, Joe, <laughs> for pushing me. Um, but one of the very interesting, and I decided to like have fun with it. Um, I decided to tell my story, and I decided to tell 
the senators how I felt about immigration and the fact that in today's economy and we needed smart, talented, hardworking people, um, and that all of these things about like you know immigration taking away American jobs and immigration lowering American wages was all but a myth. And there are like so many studies and so many so much data and so many polls done that actually disprove all those theories. But the one thing that I remember was that um, I remember Senator Rockefeller asking me at the end of my testimony was, so you saw this job opportunity at Facebook and you walked right in and got a job, right? And I was like, um, no, that's not <laughs> how it went. I walked in, I interviewed <laughs> with a lot of different people and then I got a job. Um, so <laughs> it was a very impactful emotional experience for me. Um, it gave me a better understanding of the topic. It also made me understand the importance of comprehensive immigration. Um, I've met many talented students here in the Bay Area, um, some of which are in the audience, who graduated from Stanford as undocumented um, students and had great GPAs, but were never able to get an internship and are still unable to get a job because of the fact that they're undocumented, um, out of no fault of their own. And to be able to get into a school like Stanford to work really hard and be able to work towards that GPA and then not be able to see future is really sad and disappointing. So it was great. Um, so we're, we're almost out of time. So Jose wanted to kind of give you the, the last question, which is, you know, we've, we've seen this film where I think this is the second screening of this film. Second, yes. Um, we had, <laughs> you had one, one in Washington and our, our whole team that was there couldn't stop crying. Um, what, what do you hope does the impact of this film and what do you want people to take away uh, from having seen this? Well, you know, we're hoping that we'll be in theaters at some point in the fall. Um, but through Define American, please uh, visit defineamerican.com. Uh, we're trying to figure out how we can get more support so we can give, we can take this film in places that really need to see it. Um, and I am trying as much as possible to kind of stay in, you know, I'm not a politician. And I'm not a policy wonk. Have you considered running for office? No, never. <laughs> I'm never going to do that. I'm, I can't. I will never do that. Um, I am a writer. I'm a filmmaker, and my job is. My job, I, for me, is to tell stories that illuminate a complicated issue and make you deal with it, and wrestle with it. Um, and I'm happy that the film turned out the way that it did. Um, but the goal now is, how do we use culture? How do we use media? How do we use art uh, to create a space that is, can be so polarizing, right? So polarizing and so misunderstood. So that's what we're hoping to do with that. So please, go to defineamerican.com and support us. So um, with everyone here, you know, as the leader of a political organization, I can't help but end for, with a little pitch to get involved. Um, so the most important thing that we can do to pass comprehensive immigration reform right now is to make sure that every member of Congress hears our voices. And change starts here at home. Uh, California is a critical state for immigration reform. We have key members of Congress throughout the state that will decide the fate of this legislation. Um, so now is the time for action. We need you guys to get your friends, your family, to reach out to members of Congress, whether that's phone, letter, Twitter, Facebook, um, or in person. I think we're going to have up on the screen. Um, so I'm going to ask you guys all, I hope you, you know, I know you've kept your phones away. If you can take out your phones. I know you got them. And uh, text ACTION to 650-226-8764. Uh, eight, eight, um, and we will keep you guys up to date with ways to, uh, to get involved and to help. Uh, we're organizing across the country um, to make sure that members of Congress hear from constituents um, all over the country that this is such an important issue and that change needs to happen now. Um, so I think that we all deserve to give Jose, sorry, that Jose deserves and Gabby, the stars of this film, uh, a final round of applause and thank all of you for coming. <laughs>